Welcome to another video from Lockdown Electronics with me Bill and this time we're going to take a look at the building blocks of digital electronics and explore some logic circuits. So let's go and see what our sensors can tell us about what's going on. Okay we're going to start by looking at a few principles of uh, digital electronics and firstly digital circuits work with either off or on states and that that's how they differ essentially from analog circuits. Sometimes this is called boolean, i.e. false or true, where false is off, true is on. Most logic ICs use a 5 volt supply, not all of them, but the vast majority do. CMOS logic gates define off as being between 0 and 1.5 volts, and they define on as being between 3.5 and, and 5 volts. So it's not quite the same as on or off in the sense of a light switch or something but there are two definite voltage ranges for the true and the false state. These voltages are for the inputs. Um, the output spec on uh, logic ICs is usually tighter than that. An IC packages often contain several gates or several um, circuit components if you like. Okay let's look at an example. Um, in fact, let's look at three examples. Firstly, the 74LS04, which is a hex inverter. Um, more strictly, it's actually uh, six NOT gates. And the symbol is a, a triangle there with um, input A and the output O. The circle uh, that you can see there uh, indicates that inversion is taking place. Now, with all, uh, well, with most logic uh, circuits, there's what's called a truth table which allows you to work out what's going to happen depending on the state of the inputs. And so for the hex inverter it's quite a simple one. When A is low, uh, the output will be high, and when the, out when the A is high, the output will be low. Um, simple as that. Um, the 74 ls which is a quad NAND gate, um, and this is a symbol for a NAND gate, again you notice it's also got that circle indicating that inversion takes place so it's a N AND gate and I've picked that one because NAND gates are often referred to as the universal gate because it's possible by using combination of NAND gates to pretty much simulate every other type of gate that there is. So the truth table for a NAND gate um, when both inputs are low output is high when one of the inputs is um, high and the other is low uh, the output is still high and if both inputs are high then the output is low. Okay, uh, last one is the uh, 40106 which is a hex, hex Smith trigger and you, you know, probably notice the symbol is very sim similar to the uh, hex inverter except it contains that symbol. That symbol is meant to be an idealized hysteresis curve because the, um, the res hysteresis response of Schmidt triggers is usually uh, better than that of a hex inverter but we don't need to worry about that today. So truth table again it's identical to the hex inverter um, it simply produces the opposite. Okay let's have a look at a specific example now very often and certainly for the hobbyists this is very common they come as um, dual in line package and the classic is usually a 14 pin package. They're incredibly easy to use but I ideal for um, a breadboard in that pin 14 requires the positive supply and pin 7 requires the ground connection and then that's your, that's your chip all set up there ready to go. Uh, so if you think about the 74LS00 which is the quad NAND gate there's three connections and so the gate, uh, the first gate is on inputs are on pins 1 and 2, output is on pin 3 and it's a quad 1 so there's another three gates on the trip on the chip as well making use of all the connections. Now today I'm just going to use the connections for the gate that I'm actually using but in circuits it's good practice to always tie uh, all the gates that aren't in, in use either high or low to stop them floating um, and that reduces the, the noise and other spurii so that's that's normally good practice. Okay, let's look how we might practically use one of these ICs and the first one I'm going to look at is the Smith trigger using that as an oscillator. So it's the 40106, it's in a 14 pin DIL package so we need 5 volts on pin 14, 0 volts on pin 7 
and then it's a Heckschmidt trigger so there are six of them on here and I'm going to just use the bottom left one on this first um, example and the circuit I'm going to make up is this here so the Schmidt trigger itself has a resistor which is connected between the output and the input and there's a capacitor which is connected between uh, the input and ground now I'm using an electrolytic capacitor because I want to produce a very slow speed waveform uh, you don't always have to use an electrolytic capacitor it could be a non-polarized one it would give you a higher frequency so the square wave output is dependent on the discharge and charge rate of the capacitor plus the value of the resistor and that's what determines the frequency okay let's have a look what that looks like on a circuit board so here's the circuit uh, I've just described we've got uh, RIC there and you can see how easy it is to wire these things up on a breadboard there's the um, pin 14 um, 5 volt supply and there's the pin 7 um, going down to earth and that's the power supply requirements sorted so we've got the resistor and the capacitor that you saw in the circuit diagram attached to pins 1 and 2 uh, channel 1 of the scope is attached to the output so let's have a look at the signal that's coming out and you can see there that the baseline is actually there so the zero state is slightly above uh, 1 um, but certainly well below the 1.5 we talked about earlier and the high state is up at about uh, 5 volts just there so you can see the um, very obvious uh, square wave probe 2 is attached to the um, positive end of the capacitor um, and so we can have a look at how the charging and discharging of this capacitor is influencing what's going on in the circuit so let's turn on channel 2 and uh, lower the trace down a little bit so that it makes a bit of sense and then we'll just enable that there we go okay so I think the first thing to note is that uh, zero volts there is there so we've already got um, quite a, an amount of DC voltage. You definitely need to have the scope in DC coupling mode and you're looking at these kind of circuits so to see what's going on. Uh, as you can see with the output voltage there is no negative going component of that waveform. It's all above the, the zero line as is this one. And you can see straight away that the charge and discharge um, of that capacitor uh, is essentially what is driving the Schmidt trigger to produce the, the square wave output. Okay, let's have a look what we can do with uh, a signal like that and the kind of thing you might want from a signal like that would be a, a clock to lay to time a, a microprocessor or something like that. So that's quite a common requirement of digital circuits is to have a, a pulses in that format. So let's see what we can do with them using some more logic circuits. OK, we've seen our Schmidt trigger in action producing that uh, square waveform. So let's now try and make use of that waveform by passing it through uh, another logic uh, gate. So here's our Schmidt trigger circuit and um, producing a square wave and we're going to feed the output of that into a gate. And you may recall from previous uh, slides that this symbol is that of a NAND gate and not AND gate. And I'm going to feed the pulsed output into uh, input A of the gate and I'm going to connect input B to 5 volts but I'm going to do that through uh, a push button switch so normally it will be not high uh, unless I press the switch in which case it'll be it'll become into the high state now whilst that would probably work it's very poor practice because that means when the button isn't pressed that input B is what we call floating so what we do is we put a resistor between uh, B and ground which holds B essentially at ground potential and when I press the button uh, it goes high and that stops uh, it being in its floating state uh, that's called a pull down resistor and in this case it's going to be about a K so our square wave output then from uh, the output of the NAND gate is dependent on the NAND truth table and if you look there in pretty much all three of the cases unless 
whilst the input B is low, in other words the switch isn't pressed, the output's going to remain high. So we shouldn't see the pulse waveform unless I take input B high, in which case we should start seeing it. OK, here's the additional circuitry now. This is the 74LS00, uh, which is the quad uh, NAND gate. And just so you can see what's going on here, I've got the output from the oscillator going into the A input of the first gate on that chip. This is the 1K pull-down resistor. And then we've got a link to a push-button switch here. And pressing that switch uh, takes the B input of that gate high. So let's have a look what's happening. We've got channel 1 of the scope still attached to the oscillator. Channel 2 is now attached to the output of that gate. Um, so let's have a look at the display and you can see what we've got there is we've still got the pulsing going on as normal and we appear to have nothing here. Actually if you look what we actually have got is that that gate is high. And if you want to spend a bit of time perusing the truth table you'll see that in all situations when gate when input B is held low the output will always be higher. Remember it's got that inversion going on. So if we now take gate 2 high by pressing the button straight away you see uh, we now start to get the pulsed waveform. But if you notice it is actually inverted compared to the other one and you've obviously got a a timing issue here. It's taking a little bit of time for the gate circuitry to do its stuff and that's obviously showing up in the, the timing of the waveform. So loose the button, take input B low, the output goes high. Pressing the button, taking input B high means the, the pulse is now being allowed through but it is uh, inverted. Okay, having seen the output of our NAND gate uh, and we've noticed that uh, it was inverted, uh, if we wanted to put that, if the circuit required us to put that the right way up, one way to do that would be to put it through an inverter, a NOT gate, which is the third of the uh, three integrated circuits that I mentioned to you at the start of this video. And the inverted output again will be dependent on the NAND truth table. Now you might recall earlier on I mentioned that the NAND gate is sometimes called a universal gate because it can be used to uh, set up circuits that effectively emulate other types of gate. So I've got, I've got four NAND gates on my quad NAND gate chip, so I've got three spare at the moment, so I could have used one to create a NOT gate. And if I had simply wired a NAND gate up like that with both inputs tied together, that effectively would have given me a NOT gate. In this case, however, I'm going to use the inverter chip to show you a third chip in use. Right, let's go and have a look how that looks on the scope. OK, here's the third uh, iteration of the circuit. So um, there's the Schmitter Grass later. That's the NAND gate, the LS004. And here, sorry, LS00. And here we've got the um, 74 LS. 04, which is a hex inverter, um, and I've got the output of that uh, first gate, the first NAND gate, going to the input of the first inverter on this chip, uh, and channel 1 of the scope is attached there, channel 2 of the scope is attached to the output. So you, you may recall uh, we'd got that waveform, we wanted to invert it. Currently um, we've got the output is high from the NAND gate on channel 1 and therefore the output from the inverter is low so that's correct and if I now press the push button which allows the pulses through the NAND gate as we saw earlier we've now got uh, an inverted pulse coming out of the other side of the inverter and an advantage of the inverter it's also cleaned up the pulse quite considerably and we've got that nice um, scare wave back so that's, that's quite handy a uh, handy thing to do if you need to, to clean up a pulse and indeed a Schmidt trigger is even better at doing that kind of thing. Okay well that's about it for our first look at uh, some logic circuitry and I hope you've spotted that it it really is very easy stuff to work with and, and it's ideal for working on a small uh, breadboard so I encourage you to perhaps have a go and learn. Um, it's something I've been interested in for a long time and uh, even putting this video together has really made me go back to some of my reference books to have a look and to make sure I was um, 
getting things absolutely right. So, you know, it can be a great learning tool. So I'd encourage you to have a go. Hope it's made some sense anyway. Thanks very much for watching. If you've liked it, please click the thumbs up. If not, you can click the thumbs down. Either way, it'd be great for you to interact. Uh, thanks very much and please consider subscribing.